welcome to NAPOD, where we provide NA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us to be self-supporting by visiting NAPOD.xyz, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two in the virtual basket. If you're also an AA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Sobercast. Sobercast features AA speakers and workshops in the same format as NAPOD. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Sobercast, that's two words, on any podcast player app or go to Sobercast.com. Enjoy the podcast, and thanks for listening. Thank you. I'm Paul Lemonetti. Um, I don't know where I'm going to go today. Uh, I, I, I'm I made a workshop by myself, and I don't like that. <laughs> I mean, let's just get that out of the way. I don't like that. It's like the second time this has happened. You're supposed to be sharing a workshop, and then you're the only guy here. And, and I usually like because. I can, now I have to talk longer, and then, and then the longer I talk, the more I lie sometimes like that. So you need to understand that, <laughs> and I let you know some of these stuff. It may, it'll, it'll be the truth, but it may only be half, because I, all the time I don't want to tell everybody everything that's going on with me. So it just may be half, so you might have to dissect some of this stuff and ask me later, oh, did that really happen that way? And I might say no, but here's the real truth. Um, keep it simple. You know, and, 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 and it's simple. It says simplicity is the key to our is the key to our symbol. Let me know that I'm going to and, and the symbol is is, is is the program of Narcotics Anonymous. It, it denotes the way we're going to what the God of our understanding is going to be asking us to do in this process. And it talks about the occult and esoteric connotations that's in this symbol. But they tell me that the mystical part of the occult. Why am I here? Why do I have a disease that I have no control over? It's, it's a mystery to, to, to people that are not in the program of Narcotics Anonymous. Why do you continuously do things knowing that it's killing you on a daily basis? The occult is that only intelligible by special people. So what that's telling me that everybody in this room is special. You know, we understand one another as addicts. It's no way in the world I could go to people outside the program of Narcotics Anonymous or people that are not addicts and I can tell them the things that I've done in my past and them not looking at me like I'm insane. But coming into the program, they told me that I was insane. And that's why I did the things that I did. Um, not, and, 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 and in my active addiction, I didn't know that I was insane. I just thought I was just using too much and, and, and I didn't even think that those were the behaviors of a person using narcotics. I just thought, you know, this is the life that I was dealt. This is where I was going to be. Um, and it was just no end to it. You know, we have a seat here for the, for the person that can never, that will never make it to the meetings of Narcotics Anonymous. Well, I thought at one time I was that person never to make it to the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. You know, um, but there's still hope for that people, for, for, there's still hope for somebody to be sitting in that chair one day. Because I didn't think that I'd ever, matter of fact, I didn't even know there was a room in Narcotics Anonymous. I need to tell you that my first uh, my, my first, um, the first person that I came in contact with that was in a program with any type of recovery was my father. You know, so 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 he was my predecessor. He was also my predecessor in the disease of addiction. You know, and and and, and he was the person that I wasn't going to be like, be, be like. Um, my father was a what, what you call it, a raving alcoholic. You know, he was the guy that was in Mayberry RFD. You know, Otis in Mayberry RFD when he would straddle the telephone and, 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 and the wife would get on, and he would get on the telephone and call his wife up and says, get the kids out of the street, I'm coming home. Well, that was my father. You know, that was my father. We lived in the housing project in New York City, in Brooklyn. And he and, and, and he had to come down the Marcy Project, and he would have to come get off that bus coming from Delancey Street because he worked in Lower Manhattan. And he would get off that bus, and he would come down on that there um, and the fence. It was a fence that came all the way to the building that I lived in. And had that fence not been there, he probably would have never made it into the house. You know, he was the guy that everybody, he was the alcoholic that everybody would laugh at, you know, and tease, and, oh, there goes Mr. Fred, ha, 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 and like that. And to the point that I got to that same point where I had to start laughing at my father because I was hurt so bad, and if I had not laughed or everybody knew I was hurt, and then I would have to start crying, and the teasing would affect, they would have, they would have seen 
how the teasing of my father would have affected me, and I couldn't allow that to happen. So early on in my so early on in my life, I had to learn how to mask feelings because of the because of the things that my father was doing. I remember being in rehab, and 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 and, and we had what they what they had the peer evaluation thing. And, you know, you're getting it with some people call it the hot seat and all that other stuff, but we was peer evaluation. And I was told early on, probably two weeks in, 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 in to that um, rehab, and some white guy, and I am, and, and I'm not, and the rest is just a white guy because, it, you know, where I came from, we didn't deal with whites, we dealt with blacks and Puerto Ricans, that was it. And that was, that's just the way it was. But also, I'm going to talk about white people so I can tell you how the confusion in my life got started early on. So some white guy comes up and says, Paul has inappropriate laughter. We see it all the time. I was pissed because here's somebody that don't know me from nobody in the world. And he's seen me for two weeks and probably three days because you know how blinded we are when we first come into rehab. We don't really see nothing because I couldn't even find my way to the bathroom. It was right next door. Anyway, he said I had inappropriate laughter. And that means when you're in pain, you would laugh. How the hell did this guy know this? Who was he to be telling me about me before I even before I even told you about who I was? You know, and early when I came in the room, they talked about we had each other's eyes and ears, and I didn't understand none of that stuff. So he was telling me that he seen something to me that I needed to change, and I wasn't ready to change because I was still in so much pain, and I was laughing all the time. I was always happy, Paul. Oh, Paul, so happy. I was pissed that I had to I had to lower myself to come into the rooms, I mean, into a rehab. I'm sitting in a rehab because I was never going to be like my father. My father went to rehab, and then I'm seeing the, the correlation between me and my father. Now, once I got it, so a couple of days clean, and then, then I'm saying, damn, my father went to rehab. Damn, my father was a bum. And I need to understand that I had a stepson that I was a bum to. You know, people were teasing me, calling me a crackhead. You know, they were calling my father alcoholic, and now I was putting my son through the same shame that my father put me through. You know, and, but I didn't want to be like him. And then, somebody, and, and, and then I had to laugh my way through that. Because I had to laugh at myself because, oh, fuck these guys. Yeah, we other folks, they don't mean nothing to me. But it did mean something to me when they were calling me those names. It did mean something to me when his friends were selling me the drugs that I was using. You know, I was belittled by that. You know, and then they were talking about me to him, and he had to defend me. You know, it would be little when I had to give my son the money to hold so that I didn't spend, so I didn't spend the mortgage money. That's belittling. And then I have to go to him like I went to my parents and got it back because they wouldn't hold it no more. Because they got tired of me coming, they come knocking on their door at 3 o'clock in, in the morning with some lie about how come I needed the money. You know, what bill was I going to pay 3 o'clock in the morning? You know, so I, and so I had to go to him, wake him up before he had to go to school. And he had to go to school tired because I was up all night, not, you know, waking him up every half hour. Because, you know, we couldn't spend it all. You know, I just couldn't get it all in the year. Could have just went and bought eight ball in the set. Well, that'd have been going too fast, <laughs> you know. But that, but that, but that was the same destruction that I was putting in his life, you know. And, 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 and the reason I say, you know, this white guy pissed me off because you need to realize I grew up in the fifties, you know. And you got to re remember that in the sixties, in the late late sixties, I mean, in, in the sixties, late fifties, in the sixties, busing started, the integration in the city, in, 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 in the country started. So now I, my mother, being a good parent that she was, she wanted a better education for me. So she put me on a bus and bussed me to the white neighborhood so that I could get a better education. She wanted to give me the opportunity that she didn't have. And also I need to tell you I was ashamed of my mother because she couldn't read. I mean, no, I, let me say that. She didn't graduate high school and she was an uneducated woman, but she could read. And I never understood how she could read. So I, so, so coming into the program of Narcotics Anonymous, there was a God working in her life because my mother would sit down and read a novel in probably a day. But she never graduated high school, and she couldn't. But if you've seen her write a letter, she couldn't spell, but she could read. Mm -hmm. And I used to think she was playing reading the books. You know, I would go behind her and say, "Fuck, I'll read this book," because I knew this damn lady can't read. And I read the book, and I start questioning about the book that she read. She told me about the book in more detail than I understood. You know, so I, I never understood how she did it, but she did it because she willed herself to read. And my mother was always about education. She wanted her kids to have an education. So she busted me. 
And I thought it was a good thing, you know, you get on the bus, you know, you get on the school bus, because we always walked to school. It was always a neighborhood school. You walk to school, you know, you in New York City, you them groves and the droves of kids. You all come, like, always converge into this one street, and everybody got into the school. You know, everybody went to the south, the same block, going to the school. And that was kind of cool, you know, because it, you know, because the parents wasn't like, Grandma, she, my mother had nine kids. There ain't no way in the world she would take all of us to school. That's out. You know, <laughs> that's out. And the school bus didn't do like they used to do, like they do here. You know, at every house they stop and pick up one kid. I think it's the stupidest thing in the world. And I'm pissed off because now I'm driving. And every time I go to work, is I live five blocks, I mean four or five blocks from where I work. And sometimes it takes me 20 minutes to get five blocks because the damn kids can't get a central location. And, get, and, and, and that's a problem of mine that I got to get through. Why do they have to pick up every kid at every door? You know, I, I don't see no sense in that. They got to open that bus door and then they can't pass. Because in New York City, you pass that fucking bus. You know, I don't know where they gave this. You know, <laughs> but here they, 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 you know, we stop real kindly and politely and then we just don't go by around the bus and kill the kid on the other side. But anyway, you know, so I got bus to these schools. So I get there and I remember the first day. We all, all us black kids get off the bus and then we had the kids looking out because these white, these white kids never seen black kids because it was in the white neighborhood. And you need to know that. And they looking out the window and shit, you know, like we were some, like, some zoo exhibit or something. You know, everybody looking out the window. And this is the third grade when I went here and this is what I'm feeling when I'm asking all these people looking at me. What the hell is this? Different? So we were talking out, everybody looking out the window. And the first day we got out there, my brother had a fight. We, we just got off the bus, my brother had a fight, and said, oh, fuck, they go to the neighborhood. Go, you know how you always used to talk about us, they go to the fucking neighborhood. You know, he used to move out when he came in, and all that other stuff. They go to the neighborhood, they all go leave. <laughs> but anyway, but, you know, but then I get to school, you know, you get acclimated to the school, and I was kind of liking it, you know, it was about an hour away. But what I seen, and you're going to the, from the third grade to the fourth grade to the fifth grade, that my life started to change because... You talk about the chameleon that we talk about, that, 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 that we become an active addiction. Well, you become that chameleon early on because now I'm over here with all these white kids and they're doing different things than I do when I come to the neighborhood with all black neighborhood and they were doing different things. The languages were even different. You know, so now I had to conform to the language when I went to the school and then when I got off that bus I had to get a whole new language when I stayed over here. So you're talking about confusion for a kid that's nine, ten years old. You know, and then and the confusion started, and I brought that confusion into, in, in, into my addiction. I brought that, that confusion into my adulthood, you know, not really knowing where I belong. You know, I didn't really know where I belong. Where did I fit in? You know, because the things in the, the sports, the way we played sports, you know, we played punch ball in the neighborhood. I went out there, they didn't play punch ball. We had to teach them how to play punch ball. Fuck, don't everybody play punch ball? You know, when we played handball, we played handball against the wall. They went to a park and played handball on a handball court. What the hell is this? You know, so a whole culture was different. And I had to conform to both of these cultures at the same time while I'm trying to navigate myself through my early, my, my early years. And not knowing what was going on. You know, so now I'm living, I'm like Patty Duke, you know, living a double life or something like this. I'm over here and I'm over here. You know, wow, wait. Um, so I went through that, and through that. Then I went to the junior high school, you know, the junior high school here, they got middle school and all that other stuff. I went to the junior high school, and it was about, it was just saying, I went to the all-white junior high school. But then the influx of blacks is coming. And then here's the, here's, the, here's the real part. The more black people came, I started not liking them because I sort of started thinking, that, shit, I like these white guys because y'all did more things for some reason. You know, we did basically the same stuff all the time in the same spot, but your guys actually moved around and shit. You know, you, you I don't know about that. Like, y'all do, do a lot of stupid shit, though. Y'all take a lot of more chances and stuff than, than we actually took. Or maybe there was more opportunities available to y'all or something like that. But that's my thinking. You know, but it wasn't until I, you know, until, and, 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 and until you get older that there was opportunities to me that was given to me. Because if I had taken the same things that I learned over there and it's kept into my life and did over here because I couldn't wait to be able to go to high school where you could pick your own high school. Because I was getting away from y'all because y'all were getting me sick. I couldn't take it no more. I wanted to be a brother. You know, I started talking funny. People said, how do you, how you talk like that? And then this is where I was going to be. And I didn't want to talk like that anymore. Man, you talk weird. You know, um, so I picked the high school that I wanted. He liked with the vocational high school because then, you know, we still... <laughs> yeah, they changed the name now, baby. That's why he said that's how long ago they changed the name. <laughs> but anyway, I went to Eli Woody Vocational High School. I took up cabinet making tree. 
Because even then, we weren't steered to college. See, I wasn't steered to college. And then and that's another thing. I wasn't steered to go to college, you know, um, because still then, you know, they didn't think that I was smart enough to go to college. My grades are good, but they never steered me to college. They always steered black folks to vocational education and white people to colleges. And this is just the way it is. It's not a racist thing. This is the way it is. So this is what I was brought up with. You know, this is my story, so don't call me no racist after the end. <laughs> you know, but this is the way I was steered. And if anybody's my age, they understand what I'm talking about. You know, this is the way I was steered. So the opportunities that were afforded to me, I really never took advantage of them because I was, nobody never guided me into these things. You know, I wasn't guided in that direction. You know, my fam, my, my mother and father was talking about, well, my mother was, my father really wasn't having nothing. He was a good guy. I'm going to my father was a great man. I'm going to tell you about that later on, too. Um, but my mother was a great woman. She understood what I needed because she didn't have the things that she knew that I needed. You know, she wanted me to get the things that she didn't have. And she didn't have the money to do it, but she knew that there was a system called education, the Board of Education, that would, give, that would afford me these things. So she made sure that I would put in the right spot so that I could get those things. Um, she wasn't no church girl, but she always wanted me to go. You know, I had an aunt that went to church, and she always wanted me to go with her. You know, um, I remember her coming to the house, praying up the house, and all that other stuff. It was that's funny. But anyway, I wasn't afforded you know, at those, so I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I wasn't led toward going to college. So I got to the junior high school. I mean, the high school that I was going to, like Whitney Vocational High School. Say it again. Um, <laughs> And I got to the school, and I took up cabinet making. And I loved it. I mean, I loved it. I mean, I was good with my hands. I was making cabinets all over the place. I was, I, I, and, 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 they, and I was selling cabinets out of the school and all this other stuff. So I was already manipulating because we were told to make it, bring it home, and you keep it. You know, one project a year. I was good. I made about five, six projects a year. I was making people coffee tables and end tables and furniture sets and shit. You know, there was people that, that, that they couldn't afford it because all you had to pay was for, for, for the wood, you know, which was almost nothing at that time. And... And, 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 and in the school, they had the, 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 the storage closet where the people that couldn't afford to pay for it, and they have done them. And so I would buy those, and I would fix those up, and I would sell them. So I was already scheming. You know, I learned how to scheme at an early age. I Man, I was just selling tables. To every, the whole neighborhood had, he like with any vocational cabinet, I mean, um, coffee tables and, and end tables. I dressed up the whole damn building. You know, in the project, you know, you got six stories, four apartments on each floor. Everybody had shit. You know, I was just selling stuff. You know, um, man, and I was good at it. You know, um, so I so I graduated high school, and I was a bum. <laughs> and let me tell you that I wasn't using in high school. I didn't smoke. I didn't use. I didn't say my let me see, my story ain't one of these twelve-year-old junkies. I wasn't a twelve-year-old junkie. It was until so I got out of high school, graduated high school, good grades. I tried the college thing in the community college because, you know, I wasn't going to work. I was still lazy. I wasn't going to work, so I went to college. I dropped out real quick. You know, I think I did a couple of two semesters. And that's another part of my story. But, you know, you come in there, you tell everybody I went to college and all this other stuff, but you never told that you didn't graduate. You know, so now it took a long time to let people know that I didn't graduate. But we come in with this long resume. You know, I've been to college. I've been in the Army. I did this. I did this. But I finished none of those things. None of those things are completed. So I dropped out because I wasn't going to do nothing. I used to like to gamble. I'd be on the, you know, shoot the sea low and all that other stuff. That's where I was going to make my money. I thought I was a hustler, you know, and I couldn't hustle. I was, bottom line, I was a nerd trying to fit in. <laughs> That's what I was. I was a nerd trying to fit in, you know. I didn't have no car. I, you know, I started to get the tailor-made clothes because I had to change the perception of who I was because you were laughing at me because of my father. So I had to dress up the outside so that I could look good. I could look like I was in. You know, I wore the, you know, the, the, the tailor-made pants and the alligator shoes and the big super fly hat and the knick-knick shirts and all that other stuff that we used to wear to make me look like when the, when the exploitation movies came out and the, and the jumpsuits and all that looked like a faggot, you know, with a jumpsuit on. And now that, now you know, looking gay either. <laughs> but that's what we look like, you know, with the big cuff in your pants and then you're walking around like that. You know how stupid you look. But that was it. And I needed to belong to that culture too, you know. But I was, a, like I said, I was a nerd trying to be cool. You know, I didn't have a girlfriend. 
<laughs> but I said I did. Because you remember we always had my girlfriend live on the other side of town. I used to say that. Yo, know, my girl live over there in the Farragut. You know, and I'm living in Marcy. There was always another project, girl. They always knew every project. When you live in New York City, you know every project. The Farragut, the Marlboro, you know, the, some of the houses and all of them their projects that's in your neighborhood. You knew all of those because this is this is what we were in. You know, you played the basketball there and all this. I, mean, I wasn't that good in sports either. I tried to play. I wanted to fit in in that. You know, I was a pretty decent baseball player, but I was lazy. I didn't want to practice. So when I got to the game, I really wasn't that good, but I was okay. You know, I was always mediocre and everything because I was lazy. You know, I wanted to do a lot of things, but I didn't want to apply myself. You know, and, that, and I didn't know that was a part of the disease of addiction because I was just lazy. You know, so anyway, I didn't, I didn't want to work. My mother got tired of that because she wasn't going to raise no bum. You know, Paul, you get yourself a damn job or you get the hell out of the house. I mean, that's just the way it was. It wasn't under that you could stay here till you're 28. <laughs> you know, I see that now, but no, you wasn't doing that. You were 18. You, you, so I, so I hung around. I, I, I did this college thing for a little while. I, I stopped going to college, and I, I did. I got a job. I got a job at Park and Name Place. I never forget it. I was making a dollar eighty-five, dollar sixty-five cents an hour. Good money, you know. If you get up to two dollars, then you're middle income in that day. But I was making a dollar sixty-five cents an hour, and. They, it was a nameplate company, and they used to make nameplates for cars. You know, Chevrolet, Ford, and all that other stuff. You know, you put the, the nameplate used to be on the side of the door panel. When you open up the door, you see that Fisher, body by Fisher thing. We used to make things like that. And I got this job in August. And in this, and in this, and this factory, you would... You had this big old vat, and the, the metal came down, they stamped the, you know, the name on the metal, and you had to put the dyes on it. And they had all these different vats and stuff that you had to soak these big old trays and all these things in. And, and it was like 2,000 degrees in this place. And you had to wear this rubber suit, you know, and, and, and you had the big long gloves, and you had put that in there, take it out of that vat, and put this in this vat, and you better hope that you don't slip because you're just done. I'm 18 years old, 18 years old doing this. Everybody in the place is older than me. It looked like my father. It looked like they drank all the time. You know, you go out, I went out to lunch that one day, and I was sitting outside, everybody's sitting outside on the curb, you know, eating the sandwich and sitting there, you know, I got my bag, I got my lunch. And I'm looking like, I'm looking at, I'm looking at, man, I ain't going to be like these dudes. No fucking way in the world I'm going to be like this. I never went back. I worked one day. <laughs> I've never went back. I went back and got my check. I think it was about seventeen, eighteen dollars or something at that time. And, hey, oh shit! I went back. I got my check. I get on the train, get my check, and that was my last working experience. Outside the summer youth corps job that you used to have, every summer you would get your job. You know, get your thirty-eight dollars and sixty-two cents a week. You know, and then you go down to Lancaster Street, buy all your clothes for school, give your mother ten dollars, get your time verses and all that other stuff. You know, and you would fly. You had your car versus your pro kids and shit. You go to Layton's and you go get you a pair of Layton's and you come back. You buy a pair of $80 shoes and you're making $36 a week. <laughs> How smart was that? You know, how smart was that? And that's what we would do. You know, so school time come, you know, you had to put on your best stuff for the first day of school. You go after you step it and shit. You know, you go to school with this Layton Dawn and all this stuff and cornfields and all those crazy names. Because you think the people were designing folks. We did that then. And now that I'm sitting around, ain't no way in the world I paid $30 for a pair of jeans. You idiot, you paid $80 for a pair of shoes and you made $30. See, but I talk about y'all now because I think y'all crazy. Because I go to TJ Maxx now and I, it's this shit. And I go to the Clarence thing on TJ Maxx. That's how cheap I got. You know, <laughs> and I make them pretty decent money. Um, but anyway, but th but that was the lifestyle I lived. Always trying to get outside of myself. Always trying to get outside of myself. You know, um, and your parents used to yell at us about you know the music that we listen to and all that other stuff. But it's the same difference, same thing we do now. And and you find up wind up being like your parents, you know, talking about telling your kids the same thing. But anyway, but that was but that was that was my younger years. So and then I I went into service because I wasn't going to work. Fuck that. That work thing, I, I, I just couldn't do the work thing. I was 20 years old, I went to Army. By this time, I'm drinking and shit. You know, I went to school, I forgot that. I would tell you, when I did go to college, I couldn't, I only got, you know, I, I heard somebody talking, one of the speakers talking about, no, no, it was, yeah, one of the speakers talking about that his son got 12 credits in three years. <laughs> I was, I was a man, that was kind of like me, you know, 12 credits in three years. That's one semester. Three years to get one semester. So anyway, 
Um, I went to school to be an industrial arts teacher. Picture that. You know, I, said I took up industrial arts because I like shop. But I changed my major three times. <laughs> it was industrial arts, construction technology, and then, I, and then when I got out of the Army, I, 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 see, I wanted the stuff that I didn't. Oh, but I forgot to tell you that when I graduated high school, I got a scholarship. See, because here's this tough guy trying to be a tough guy that was a nerd that was passing classes. And, you know, if you're a tough guy, you can't pass classes, you know. So then I was also in conflict with that. You know, I wanted to hang out over here in the cafeteria where the people were shooting the drugs. I used to watch that in high school, but they used to do that right at the table in the high school I went to. They would shoot the drugs, and, oh, my God, that's disgusting. I'll never do that. And they were shooting up at the table, or they'd be in the bathroom. They used to do that at the time, you know. It used to be horse boy, you know, all that other stuff that they used to use. And, um... So I mean, so 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 I got a scholarship. I got a scholarship for drama because you know I was a good actor. Who <laughs> figured? <laughs> I got a scholarship to Adelphi University in New York City. Full scholarship from Sears. And you know, you're talking about choices that you make early on in your life that that, that shapes your life forever. I ain't going to fucking college because I wanted to get out of the nerd world. If I went, to, if I had went to college, then I would have been a, um, a real nerd. All the stuff my mother did so that I could go to college, and I got the opportunity to go because of the things that she did. I told her, fuck you, in other words. I didn't say that to her, but early on, looking at it, I said, fuck you. I'm not going to college. I want to be like the guy that I see nodding. But I didn't want to nod because somebody else was talking about they were always dressed up. I think it was this dude. Something like they were always dressed up. Then crack came in the game and shit, and I was a bum now. <laughs> you know, but this ain't a crack program. But but that's what happened. You know, they were always looking good. I don't even even the junkies were dressed up. You know, they always had a girl. You know, they had a girl, and and I wanted to be cool. But I was a gambler. I thought I was a gambler. I was a street gambler. You know, you play your CeeLo or all your craps on, 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 on the ground. That's what I did at the basketball court. That's what I did. You know, and I made pretty decent money doing that. You know, um, so that was my life. I wanted to stay out and I wanted to hustle. And that's the only hustle that I had was because I didn't know how to do nothing. I, one time I was selling loose joints. <laughs> you know, you buy a half an ounce and you sell loose joints. Wow, I'm going to make a lot of money now. I'm a real life dealer. And that's my drug dealer story. <laughs> get, get that out because I was a drug dealer when I first came here, but that's what I would do. I would sell a loose joint. And I'm going to tell you, my girlfriend sold more than old than I did because she took them to high school and she was selling them to high school. So I was crippling people's lives early on, too. See, I was crippling people's lives, and I, and I only found that out when I came here. You know, so, when we, so, 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 so another issue that I had to work through. I was destroying people's lives before I even knew I was destroying people's lives. And you don't find that out until you get in programming narcotics and I'm, that you were destroying lives. Anyway, so I got the scholarship that my mother, you know, fought for me to get and all this other stuff, did all the right things that she wanted to do. And then and in turn, I told her, fuck you, I'm not doing that. You know, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to take advantage of the scholarship that somebody's giving me. Somebody's giving me. It's just full scholarship. Academic. You know. What black kid gets an academic scholarship? Shit, I couldn't play basketball. Why would I go to school? I wasn't a good athlete, but I had an academic scholarship, and I didn't, and, and I didn't take advantage of it. I go past the school now, and I see all these kids come out and say, damn, I had a girl. You know, I could have been in there. You know, I could have been in there. I wanted to be Sidney Poitier or Burt Lancaster because those were my two idols. Those were my idols growing up. Sidney Poitier. At Burt Lancaster, I thought they were the best two guys in the world. Yeah, I watched all their movies. I wanted to be them. But as usual, I didn't have the courage to do the things that, that needed to be done to get that. You know, I didn't have the courage. Early on, I didn't have courage. You know, um, then I come into the rooms of program, program of Narcotics Anonymous, and they're talking about I needed, I, I was a coward. Well, I didn't mind, you know, running through the neighborhoods. I would go three or four o'clock in the morning, you know, go on the cop and all that shit, and I wasn't afraid of nobody out there. But I, but, 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 what they taught me is being fearful. I mean, being, being, being fearless has nothing to do with courage. You know, that has nothing to do with having courage. Courage is, is, is the ability to go out and do the things that you need to do to get the results that you need to get. You know, and not having fear is just being a stupid ass motherfucker because you're just running around thinking that you're tough and you're not. You know, it's a different. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I have fear walking in front of a car, but I don't have fear of somebody pulling their gun out me and going to cop. I didn't. I wasn't worried about that. I was tough. You, know, you used to walk with the knife in your glove, and you know, you going to cop. I wish somebody was there for me. I wasn't no tough guy. Dude, I was a punk. You know, I wasn't that good with my stuff. 
You know, I would fight, but I wasn't a good fighter. But I was always fighting. You know, and it used to be, man, I'm good with my Schmitties. I wasn't that good, man. No, I wasn't that good, but I never ran. You know, that was my thing. Paul will fight you for a half hour. I would have to tire your ass out. <laughs> I had a lot of energy. <laughs> but, you know, straight up boxing somebody down, that wasn't my story. You know, that ain't my story. I wasn't that tough. I thought I was going to be in the Golden Gloves one day, but me and my partner practiced in the elevator going up and down. I'd never been in no gym. <laughs> but I wanted to be a Golden Gloves fighter because I thought it was cool. There was a guy in my school that used to always win. His name was Charlie Hunter. i never forget this guy. He used to win 106 pounds. And I could have been pretty good because I was skinny. And, 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 and I could have, you know, probably fought 106 pounds or something like that because you got to know when I was a little bit go back down. 106 pounds to get my side. But, you know, my weight, I would have been older than all the people that I was fighting. Because of my weight, you know, so I could have boxed the hell out of those. <laughs> and I'd have been tough. I'd have built the record up. <laughs> but my weight went up, and then the guy got older. <laughs> Man, I ain't fighting that dude. <laughs> I know how I am. See, I know I'm that good. Yeah, they may not know, but I know what I can do because I wasn't no fighting dude. <laughs> I would like to tell y'all that, but nope, I wasn't. I was in. I was living in the inner city in the project. They couldn't fight. Come on, what kind of life you have? <laughs> you know, that wasn't my story. I wasn't a fighter, but I didn't run. You know, I wasn't. I was never afraid of anybody. You wanted to fight, you fight. And I was always fast to fight. You know, the best fight I had was somebody used to talk about the cigarettes that I used to smoke. That I won that fight. I could run in that one. I hit the guy with a garbage can top, the metal garbage can top, and I was good. You know, and I was the man. I used to have on my Arrow Smith shoes. This is what I was doing. I had Arrow Smith shoes on. This high, blue, light blue, with a pair of gold bottom pants, and thought I was cool. <laughs> and the guy was talking about my Raleigh, and I fucked him up. <laughs> that was, and then I, that was my reputation. Nobody was a fall crazy. You don't fight with him, so I didn't have to fight no more. <sighs> Got scared and hit him with a garbage can. But anyway, but but there's all that to say that my life was being shaped by inconsistencies, no commitment, and, and, and fear. You know, that's the way my life was shaped. You know, wanting to do a whole lot of things, but never had the commitment or the courage to go out and do it. I was always going. And it's funny because I came into the program of Narcotics Anonymous and I got a sponsor that loved to work the program of Narcotics Anonymous. And I was always told, I'm gonna. And he says, when the fuck are you going to stop that I'm gonna shit? What do you mean? Every time I talk about you, you say something, you're always going to do it. When you want to stop going to do something, do something. I thought I was doing something, but I wasn't doing a damn thing. I was sitting here learning the program and not doing anything about it. You know, staying stuck on stupid for a long time. You know, that's my story in the rooms and archives. And I just had all the information, share like Shakespeare in a meeting, and then I wasn't doing anything. You know, keeping myself trapped up in the whole lifestyle that I came in here with, of fear, shame, guilt, and all that other stuff that I came in here with, cowardness, you know, um, I wasn't going to do anything about it, because I thought, I knew that I could, I could understand stuff, <clears throat> but I never knew that I didn't do anything, because I also went to the Army and I got the three Article 15s, here's, here's, here's the kicker, you know, in the, uh, I'm in the Army, my, my disease just blew up in the Army, I mean, I got away from my family, I could hide and do all this stuff. And I used to always get busted via drunk or high or guard duty. So I go to the army and I got him on guard duty. And here's another thing I got I got with how I got in the army, I failed the physical because I had a fro, a fro, what they call a frolic heart member, an irregular beat in my heart. The doctor told me to go home, take some volume, come back and get retested. What the hell did he tell me that for? So I went home, I took two volumes, because my mother had an ABC alphabet cabinet. You know, in the kitchen cabinet, she had too much medicine for the medicine cabinet. It was all in the kitchen cabinet, and all that medication they had, the water pills, the, the, all this the hypertension shit. My brother had epilepsy, so he had the diabombs, the dialanthems, the phenobobs, and all that other stuff. Man, I had any drug that I wanted. You know, but this is the time of pills. You know, you were taking the pill, you play, you know, it was always your up or down or red or blue, all that other stuff. I don't know what the name, what they were, but they had colors, and that's what we described them by. You know, and you had the blotter, and you had all that other stuff. You know, it wasn't, you know, and that's what we would do. And, I, and, and that's another thing you know, I got sponsored in when, when I went to, you white kids use it early. <laughs> you know, I didn't know about all this stuff until I went to those schools. You know, I seen the junkie on the corner, but I wasn't going to be like them. Y'all had clean 
drugs. You know, it didn't get you all like that. It got you all wired. It said, y'all like to just sit down with your shit. <laughs> you know, y'all would sit down and shit and take a pill and sit down and shit and space out and shit. You know, pull out some crazy music. That's what you, and that's what I see. And that's what I got attracted to, to being able to sit down because I was always moving. So you can calm me down a little bit. I'll take some of that because nobody would know. So, but I watched it. I, my family had it, but I, I wasn't touching it. I can tell you, that wasn't my story. I didn't touch that stuff. But I liked it. I liked the way y'all looked with it. You know, and my, but the doctor told me to take these, 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 these volumes. My mother had some. I didn't have to go find none on the street. My mother had some because she was using them for what she needed them for. <laughs> but anyway, I took these two volumes and I got in. So I went in the Army on, on a lie. You know, and, 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 and I came in the program, my, 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 my um, sponsor used to say, Paul, let me tell you something. Dishonesty is dishonesty, no matter how you try to display it. It all has an end result, the same end result. So now that I know what he was talking about when I went in the Army. I, the, the end result was disastrous in the Army. I got, out with, I got out with honorable discharge, but, you know, I really didn't accomplish anything there. You know, I really didn't accomplish anything. I just got the honorable discharge just so that I could see I've been in the Army. And that was another part of my resume. I've been in the Army. And he used to always say, Paul, you need to look at your behavior. His thing was, look at your behavior, your behavior record. You know, and I was just thinking, look at your behavior record. And then I had to start examining my behaviors and all of these things that I attempted to do. You know, they were always half measured. I just did them. I just did them to say that I did them. Anyway, so I get in the Army and, 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 and I get the Article 15, it's always on guard duty. You know, you got to guard the post, for, you know, you ain't nobody coming, so you get drunk all day, you do your two-hour shift, you're off for four, two, two hours, you're off for four, and one of the four, I was getting high. Yeah, I was getting high on the, on, on, on the off four instead of going to sleep like, the, you know, like the real soldiers were doing. You know, they were going to get their rest. <laughs> so when I get back, so, you know, about time they wake you up to do your, do, do your post, I was in no shape to do no post. So... I would go back in the barracks to somebody else's barracks and sleep in their bed, and then the officer of the day come by, and I'm not out there. And then all of a sudden, he'd call him left side, and you got the walkie talkie, everything on you, and, and, you, and you disappear. You know, you're not there. So I got Article 15 for the same behavior three times. And I get out of the Army, I need to find a job. I got a job at a printing company. Oh, I also went to school for printing, too, because I wanted to be a printer. I forgot about that. I got a job at this printing company being a dispatcher, and then, they, and then they, oh, they had open enrollment for New York City corrections. Fuck it. I was a fuck up security guy in the Army. I might as well be a correction officer, right? So I get the job as a correction, a New York City corrections officer. I didn't do well there either because I got fired. And I got fired for sleeping on guard. I got fired with the key in the gate. Captain comes around. I'm in the kitchen because I'm working in a Brooklyn house of detention. <laughs> the key is in the gate. I'm in the little kitchen area. I don't know who's from New York City, but whoever been, who's ever been down, that's what y'all call it. <laughs> the key is in the gate. They call, the officer of the day comes up. Like the officer of the day came in there when I was in the military. Caught me sleeping with the key in the gate. <laughs> So I lost my job the same way my life turned around in the middle. It's the, it's the same thing. And then y'all come here, y'all talk about doing the same thing and looking at it and expecting different results. Well, I had the same job that I had in the Army and then I took out in my civilian life and I was doing the same thing. I was getting high, going to work, and I lost my job. It's the funny part because, you know, I'm embarrassed now because that job was my identity. I'm a correction officer. I got a 38. I'm a black man walking around New York City with a 38. I'm the man. <laughs> I'm the man. And most correction officers, you know, dressed in the locker room, I had to wear my uniform out because that was my identity. I put my uniform on. You got to be crazy. Why would a damn officer wear a suit in, in, in Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn when you don't have to? And be a target because that was my identity. See, I didn't know who I was, but you know, my identity. I'm a correction officer. I wasn't Paul Shaw no more. I was a corrections officer. I wasn't no I wasn't no guard like some of y'all used to call them. I ain't no guard. Guards made work for for burns. I'm a corrections officer. You know, titles meant something to me. You know, so that was my identity. So I lost that job. Well, no. 
I didn't, yeah, I lost the job, but I wasn't even honest in the way that I lost it. Because, you know, you you trying to fight for your job. I had no fight. So they said, either you get fired or we let you resign. Well, fuck, resign sounds better than fired, don't it? <laughs> so, I, so, I, so I resigned, the I resigned. That way you don't have to go through the whole system. Because I wasn't going to win. You always know when you don't have a win. Yeah, I wasn't going to win. So I didn't win. You know, I, I so I signed the papers to resign. Yeah, you know, you want to go get a lawyer and fight it and all this. Ah, fuck, I'm done. See, because I need to let you know that I had my name on a list to be a New York City policeman. Mm -hmm. And that was just and that was just around the corner. I was already going through the interview process, so I was going to get out of the jail and walk the streets of New York City with my 38. Which I would have been more of a terror. <laughs> that was going to be my story, and then I would have been Paul the cop, <laughs> Officer Paul. <laughs> The guy from the ghetto is now an officer Paul. And I and I and I swear I wanted that title bad. I wanted it. I wanted it bad. And I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I was still going through the interview process, so I had to resign because one thing about civil service, if you get fired, you're done. Yeah, you're done. So I knew. I knew how to manipulate the system because I manipulated the system and to go to go back. And the way I manipulated the system when I got all those Article 15s when I was in the Army, I put all my money in allotments to my mother so that they couldn't take it. You can't take my money because you know how they take money out and get checked. You know, how you get an Article 15 older than in the military. So you put that money in your allotment and it goes to my mother and my mother would send the money back to me. See, so that way I didn't have to pay for it. It took them longer to get it because you have to have a certain amount of money, you money know, for your toilet seat, so you could take out of that. It took them about six months. And I do the same thing now. It took you about six months to get you $200, you know. Um, so, that was, so, that was, so, so that's what I was doing. Um, so I had to resign. And I didn't get the cop job. You know, they saw it through me. You know, because you have to take a psychological evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess something was a flaw. This must have been a real psychiatrist because the one that interviewed me for the correction didn't see it. But this guy must have saw it. You know, I mean, I guess. But your inability to lie the way you used to lie shrinks. <laughs> so this shrink knew that my shit was shrinking and he didn't give me the job. I didn't get the job. So now I'm crushed. I got nothing to do. I'm like a football player that don't have no more football at the end of his road. You know? I'm a uniform guy because the uniform, the uniform gives me identity, you know. So now I got no uniform. But this is the sad part about it because when I lost that job six months later, I was still putting a uniform on so that you would think that I still had my job because I didn't want you to know that I got, well, that I resigned. <laughs> I didn't want you all to know because I would have lost my identity. You know, a year later, the lady on the block said, Paul, you still got that job? Yeah. <laughs> when do you work? <laughs> <laughs> but that was my identity. The uniforms are my identity. You know, so, so I brought all this stuff into the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. You know, no identity. You know, the uncaring, the non-commitment, you know, the, 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 the fuck it, and all this other stuff, the laziness, you know, the getting sit down, the boredom, and all that other stuff. I brought all that into the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous. So they told me to do 90 meetings in 90 days, which was hard for me. 90? Fuck, that's a long time. You know, and they didn't say, you know, do one a day, the next two, ten, the next day. They, we didn't have all them catchphrases. <laughs> I don't know where they come from, but we got them now, and they're here, and they got to wait till they die. Like the clarity statement, they died away. We don't got away, they just went away. Because um, we bring a lot of things in the room to Narcotics Anonymous that shouldn't be here, but it seems to be popular at the point. And we keep it here, and when, when we and we kill people sometimes with those things that we bring in the rooms of narcotics anonymous because I can't find it to see what the significance of it is. You know, you need to understand that a lot of times I say things in the rooms of narcotics anonymous that really has no significance to the program of narcotics anonymous, and, and and we say it and we recite these things, and then soon as somebody quotes something out of the literature, well, I can't quote the literature, but you can quote that bullshit that somebody brought in, <laughs> that somebody brought in here and live up to it and think you know what it means. You know, but then you get mad at somebody that wants to quote literature out of the basic text. Oh, he's a uh, step stomper and a fucking check somatic guy or all the other crazy labels that you give him. And, 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 you know, and we come in here with enough labels, you know, a uh, spiritual guru. That ain't nice. <laughs> you know, it may sound like a spiritual guru do. That's a name. I'm Paul. Because, you see, because you need to learn. You understand it. 
they told me how to identify myself when I came here, and it took a while for me to learn that identification because as the people was talking about, I, would, I mean, he said uh, one of them Anna's. You know, I never heard that before, so I figured I threw that in today. Um, I was, you know, I was, I was a dual addicted dude. I was an alcoholic and an addict and all that other stuff. You know, so I didn't even have an identification when I came in here until I started listening to the sponsor that I had, and he told me that Paul, he, he gives you direction on how to how to recognize yourself in a meeting in Narcotics Anonymous. It says, state your name, and I'm an addict. Simple direction. You know, but a lot of times now we want to dress that up because we, I don't want to be a grateful recovering addict. It doesn't say, I'm Paul and I'm a grateful recovering addict. It says, Paul and I'm an addict. It gives me plain direction on how to present myself in a meeting. It says, our gratitude shows when I, when, when I apply the program to my life, that's, you know, when I can't share it anyway. That's my gratitude. When I work the steps, it's showing gratitude. So I don't have to tell you that I'm grateful. If I'm working a program, it'll be shown that you're grateful for the program of Narcotics Anonymous. So I don't have to tell you that I'm grateful. It's shown. When I'm saying that I'm grateful, I'm probably not because I'm not working the steps that I want you to think that I am. You know, and, and, and I've done that part. You know, that's part of my story. I always wanted you to think that I was doing something that I didn't do it. I wanted you to think that I was a cop when I wasn't. You know, I wanted you to think that I was an actor when I didn't go to school. You know, I always wanted you to think something. You know, I wanted you to think something because I wasn't thinking on my own. You know, maybe says my best thinking got me here. So why am I thinking that I know something? So I come, so I come in here, and these guys guys started to teach me stuff. Like I said, didn't have all these titles. You know, the 90 meetings, the 90 days, get a sponsor that I didn't get right away. You know, and I suffered behind that. You know, I had a sponsor in Rochester so that I could do my dirt in Canada. You know, we get those telephone and those telephone sponsors. I can see, you know, sometimes your sponsor move away and you keep that sponsor. But you don't go seek out somebody fucking 20, 20 pounds away. You know, come on. What are you doing? Who are you manipulating? Him or you? You know, because so, you know you ain't going to do no work and you can lie to him on the phone. But if he's good, he know you're lying and he lets you lie. You know how it is? Because the God gives me free will, so, he, so my sponsor will give me the will to lie to him until he gets tired of my lying. And then he'll start telling me that I need to address my lying. He says, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? But that's it. You know, so, 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 you know, talking about the topic of keeping it simple. It was nothing simple for me when I came into the program of Narcotics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand, uh, I didn't understand simplicity. You know, my life was quite chaotic. You know, simplicity was the furthest thing. The, 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 the um, only thing I ever knew about simple was somebody calling me a simpleton, you know, at the end. But I didn't know anything about being simple, anything being simple. You know, it tells me that the program is outlined simply so that maybe we can all understand it. You know, it, it, you know, it tells me to work the steps in their order. You know, when I came in here, they were, they were working the steps and traditions together. I don't know how the fuck you could do that because that's random. They said that this program is not random. So if I'm going from page 16 to page 38, that's not fucking, that's, that's random. That's like me putting all them songs on my computer and hit random. And I don't never hear a whole album. I'm just hearing a song from here and a song from there and a song from there. And nothing's really jiving. There's nothing's connection because on most albums, it's a story if I listen to the whole album. At one time, it goes from one part to the next. But if I'm listening, but I'm, if I got a program and I can't sit down, I'm going from here to here or here to here. What the fuck am I doing? What about all the stuff in between? What about me dealing with myself before I learn how to deal with you? Now, I don't understand that. That's not simple to me. I can't deal with you and me at the same time. That's why, you know, that's why the things, I know it's not in the text, it says, not, not get in the relationships. You know, and, and, and we take that too far. Because we know the program is about relationships. Once we get here for a while and we start to understand the program, we know what the program is about. Relationships, building a relationship with the group, building a relationship with yourself, building a relationship, relationship with your sponsor, that the God and you understand. It. We understand that. But now they say not to get in a relationship. Who the fuck is he doing you not to get in a we, we know that part about the basics. Like, you know, there's a lot of stuff we don't know about the program, but the stuff that you tell me not to do, I always find a way to get to you where the program don't say it. There ain't no way in the book where it said not to get in no fucking relationship. You know how we do that. We don't know, but we know what we we know what's being said. We know what's being said. Don't go take no damn no. Don't go be hostage to a woman because you think you're taking a woman hostage when you're only getting you putting yourself in a hostage situation because you're the one that can't get out. She's gone. 
You know how to go. You know, but I thought I took her hostage. No. You have put yourself in some type of bondage that you can't get out of. Because, now here's the story, here's my story with that. Shit, I ain't got no time for that one. I should have shut up a long time ago. But anyway, I was in your... Damn. <laughs> All right. I've met this woman. It wasn't the first one, but the first one that I married. Because she's the first one to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you know what it is in the basic text is talking about once we, once we meet a woman or, or get in a relationship, it come, you know, we fantasize about this relationship with the white picket fence and the two kids and all that shit. It tells us about it, how we fantasize about these, rela these romantic relationships. You thought they were lying? But we tested it anyway. They told us what we were going to do, and we do it anyway. Because there's no way in the world this is evidence of my, of my addiction. You know, this is a, we always say this is a, this is a book of by addicts, for addicts, about addicts. Well, if it's about me and it told me that I was going to do these things, why do I do it? Do I, do I actually believe in what I'm reading? Or am I just saying it? Or so do I just say that in the book? Yeah, this is a, this is a program by addicts, for addicts, about addicts. I shared my ass off, didn't I? <laughs> but we say that all the time. We say it all the time. But... And in the beginning, there's no belief system in this program. See, it says we have to develop a belief system. See, and that belief system is not developed because we do things in the contrary of what the, what the, what the principles are asking us not to do. You know, it didn't tell us that we shouldn't get in relationships. It tells us that the relationship that we get is an illusion because we don't know how to be in them. See, so that's why they tell us to practice with the people in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous and practice with the God of our understanding and practice with a sponsor and learn how to build our relationships. Because, you know, once we get that one-on-one, -on -one, we start to lose ourselves in this relationship because I want to make you what I want you to be, but I can't be who I want to be. I mean, I can't be who my God of my understanding has, be what my, the God of my understanding has in store for me because I'd be, if I get you, I don't have to worry about this no more because we're going to get this family and we're going to get this job and we're going to get this car and we're going to get this house and my life is done because it was always good on the outside, right? Because when I had the correction officer job, I had a home in New York City at 24 years old, my own home. You know, I had my car in New York City. You know, you want insurance rates in New York City, but at that time, you know, we weren't paying no insurance in right in New York City. You know, you won't get the blue card. And you get, you know, pay your fucking down payment, get your blue card. And you had no computer, so we never paid no more insurance. So whoever said they paid insurance in New York City is lying. We didn't pay it. You know, we didn't pay it. That's not part of our story. My man said he bought a car and didn't have a license. I remember. So he was still practicing the same behaviors that he came from New York City with. I remember. I heard him. And, you know, how we identify. Holy shit, I know that. <laughs> I don't forget. I don't have the luxury of forgetting. Not in the program. So, so, so that was my illusion. That's what was going to happen. We had no kids. We were pretty young. Pretty young. And um, that was what was going to happen. Um, it didn't work out that way. You know, at some point, the relationship wasn't going well, and at some point, I knew that my life wasn't going well, and at some point, desperation set in in the program of narcotics, and I'm just like the desperation that ran me into the rooms, desperation in the rooms of narcotics, desperation while in the rooms of narcotics, and I'm just by having the knowledge about the program and not applying it, it very, puts you in a very desperate state. Very, very desperate state. You know, to the point where you start to get in that fetal position, because we've all got here, if you've been in here at any time, we all have been placed in that fetal position by our own, by, by, by our own liabilities, because we didn't want to do the things that was asked of us, because our belief system was still shoddy, but we've gone to the meeting and saying that it had a God of my understanding that I didn't believe in, that I developed. I developed a God that I didn't believe in, to be honest. I had him, but I didn't believe in him. Why, what was the evidence that I didn't believe in him? I wasn't working the steps. And it tells me that, you know, it tells me in the third step, the evidence of my higher power is me continuously on with the steps. So if I didn't continue on, my evidence wasn't showing. But I was telling you I was doing it. So if I'm not working the prior steps, the evidence of my higher power is not being shown. It's not being revealed to me. Why? Because I still don't, didn't get the courage from three that I should have gotten to go on. So I got into this relationship, need to say, it didn't last. 
We were in it for five years. We separated. You know, I got took another hostage in the middle of that interim until she got tired of me. They threw me the fuck out. First, she said, I ain't having sex with you no more. And I took her out for a year, and she was telling the truth. She didn't. She gave me none. I started trying to up my game by bringing in more flowers and shit. I wasn't getting none. 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 And that was my shit. You know, because you know, my, 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 my manhood was, 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 was predicated on how much that I screwed. And I wasn't doing it. And I wasn't doing it. But what I didn't understand that she was doing me a favor because that was the time that I had honestly was sitting down with my sponsor and starting to try to apply some of the principles of the program. So God removed one of the things that stopped me from doing things because as long as I was having sex, it was an illusion of mine. I was still a man. But with that part going, and then I find out that, damn, I can't even get a goddamn girl to fuck me no more. Wow. Maybe I'm not a man. Maybe she wanted a man to show up and the boy was still there. Maybe she was becoming a woman, and I had more time, and she was advancing the program, and I was being stagnated. Hmm. So the God of my understanding had to humble me in the process of recovery in the part that I thought that I had, so I was doing the best then. I thought I was doing the best then. I didn't say I was doing the best then, because that's all that I came in here for. Well, that was it was an illusion, because I told you I wasn't no player in the street. Now they come in the room of narcotics and others and trying to be a player. I was still playing myself. Well... And then so somebody told me that you were fucking, man, you, and that probably wasn't even that good. Yeah, right. <laughs> but anyway, but that's what happened to me. That, you know, that's the shame that I had to go through, that I'm with a woman that I'm still seeing that ain't giving me none. You know, I didn't see that, that she was trying to help herself. I was just seeing that she was taking it some way, something for me. But, you know, the good addict that I am, I'm going to make her give me something. So I'm going to stay there. I'm going to stay with it. I'm going to work it out. And it wasn't nothing worked out. Pretty soon she got tired of that shit and probably had needs to own and told me the goodbye. Called me up on the phone one day. You're done. So being I was done there, what's the next best thing to do? Go bring the person back that would stay on any fucking grounds. So I brought the ex-wife back. So I brought, well, she wasn't an ex. I brought the wife back. And I heard the man share last night. He told my story like it was going to get better. God removed her for a reason. I brought her back for the same, for, 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 for a reason. Well, for the same reason, because I needed the hostages, I needed some sex, because I still wasn't done with that part. And it was disastrous. It got worse. You're talking, you're talking about, people talking about, you know, when we talk about relapse, you talk about relapse on the drug, but there's many relapses in the program of narcotics and anonymous. You know, there's many relapses. You know, because if I work the program, I find I will last in many areas of my life because, you know, you know, we talk about the drug is just a symptom and there are other symptoms of the disease of Narcotics Anonymous, you know, and that's wanting and, and that afraid of being alone. And once I learn that I can be alone and then I have to go back because the voices in my head are getting too strong and I have to go pick up somebody that I know I shouldn't be with, well, that's a lapse. You know, that's a lapse in my spiritual, spiritual condition. You know, and I need to understand, I needed to understand that. Because when I brought her back, all the work that I started to do ceased. Because I had to watch her. Because I knew she was out there cheating on me, but when she came back, it was all good. You know? And it ain't the first time it happened to me in this process. You know? So I had to, so I had to get with that. So once I got the courage that the God, if I understand, that gave me that I wasn't going to utilize until I understand, until I made a commitment to believe in the God and the, the, the God that I chose. Because my sponsor told me that I need to make a list of the characteristics that I wanted my God to be like. And when I fall short, look at that and see why God would do those things that I was doing. And I looked at it, there was nowhere that he said, where he said that, I would, that, that my God would lack courage to do the things that he would do. So I had to go to the courts, and I had to finally get divorced. I didn't want to do it. This is, I, you know, I keep this around. Let me read something to you. This is, this is the way this relationship went. I'm going to read this. No, it's not not kind of synonymous literature, but it's my story. This is where this, is where this relationship went from. And, I'm, and, and let me tell you, I'm not persecuting this woman because this is a great woman. I mean, she's a very beautiful person. It was me. I'm not talking about the things that she did. I'm talking about the things that I allowed to be done to me. You know, we come in the room and talk about if somebody would have did the things that I did to myself, I would kill them. Shit. That's a lie. Because she did some things to me that I didn't even think that could be done. You know, just like the drugs did to me. 
But here, here, here. A Canandaigua woman was arrested Saturday on charge of the first degree criminal contempt and second degree attempt assault. Attempted assault. According to the sheriff's office, I'm not going to mention no names, um, number 2H at Canandaigua Apartments in Canandaigua was waiting in a parking lot of an apartment when her husband returned home wielding a large knife and continued and, 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 and continue, a large knife is shouting at him. Shite, and I mean, I ain't going to mention a 34 had an order of protection in effect the time she was arraigned in the town court and committed uh, and committed to jail in lieu of $2,500 cash to her husband who was not injured, deputy said. This is what I went back to. This happened before I went back. No, that happened before I went back. So you talking about you had enough pain? You don't know how much pain that you will put yourself into in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous when you don't apply the principles that are embodied in the steps and traditions of Narcotics Anonymous. I allowed somebody to damn near kill me and bring them back because I wasn't done. And you talk about we don't relapse on old behaviors, you know, or, 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 or lapse in the things that I want that I can't have, you know. So that's why that, that, that's what I subjected myself to again. Again, it didn't get that desperate at the time, but the, the, but, but the mental anguish about it was worse. Why? Because I knew that I was wrong, and I allowed myself to continuously be wrong. You know, so there was nothing simple about that. But once I once I had to, but when I heard somebody said I had to do a four step on the relationship, what I had to look at why would I allow somebody to do these things to me on a continuously on a continuous basis? You know, what inside of me wanted me to die so bad in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous? Because when I just came in the rooms, I said I tried to kill myself, and then I come in the rooms and not want to apply the program because I'm lazy. I'm, uh, I'm lazy. I don't want to be committed. I just want to have the stuff and all the trappings that come along with the program and, I, and all the trappings no, that don't come along with the program of Narcotics Anonymous that I bring to the program of Narcotics Anonymous, like the car, the house, the clothes. Well, I ain't no clothes. I don't buy no clothes. You know, and the jewelry and all that other stuff. You know, I got the trappings. You know, the things that make me look like I was recovery, like the, like, like the uniform, made me look like I was doing okay in the, in, in, out, out in the sand in the public. But I had the trappings of recovery, you know, that I considered the trappings of recovery. Let me say, they don't the trappings, those are gifts if I apply them right. They are, they can be gifts. But if I don't use them in a way that the God of my understanding gives them to me, then they're only traps. Because what they tell you, the good times would be a trap. So that house that you have, that you cherish so much, could be a trap if you're not using it the way it's intended for you, which is only shelter. And that's for me to come in the room to knock out anonymous and boast about. Because it's only a place to live. You can only sleep in one bed at a time. You can have a five, a 25 bedroom house, and you only sleep in one bed. So who gives a damn? And they already told me, we don't care what you have. So I don't need to come in a room boasting about that. You know, but I had those things. I had those things through diligence in the working because we always work too much, so I can work 50 hours of overtime, you know, get the money that I need to buy these things, because I was always good at that. I was always good at having money in my pocket until again, you know, I didn't have no money in the end, because I had money in the end, I probably wouldn't be here. But I was always able to get things, you know. The program of Narcotics and Obvious teaches me how to appreciate and keep the things that I've been trained through the spiritual principles. But it really wasn't the spiritual principles that got it. It was just wants. And, was in what, and at first, it was just another way for me to trap another victim. You know, that's what it was. And I had to get outside of that. You know, I needed to learn to get outside of that. You know, not, not, I remember when I was in rehab, my, my, um, my counselor was an AA. He was an AA. And um, he told me, why do you guys buy all that jewelry? So that when you relax, you got something to sell easy? Fuck. He also told me, that he was married, his wife left him, he waited 10 years to bring her back to throw the fuck out. <laughs> Maybe I did the same thing. I brought my wife back just to kick her out on my terms. But this is how cowardly I was. I waited till she left to move out. And I think I moved to another city. I just moved to the next building. I made a big power move there, and she was never going to find me. <laughs> I moved from this apartment to this apartment. But the reason I had to do that is because by law I couldn't throw her out. Cops said I can't throw out, so I have to move. So I moved. I moved to get rid of her just to bring her back. So it's so the same insanity. What's going on in my life? Um, but I finally got the courage to get the divorce. But that don't mean with the divorce, the call stopped. You know, she still calls me. 
Now I got to still have the argument. You know, um, there's nothing there left. I'm not going back. You know, one day at a time. I'm not going back. You know, uh, it's over. You know, uh, my life is, uh, has grown in the, with this process. Let me know that there's some things that's just not there for me. You know, maybe she'll meet somebody else. And then you also need to understand that I stopped. And at some point, I stopped the growth that she needs to grow. I stopped the humility process for her, and she relapsed more than one time. And maybe had I left alone, let the God of her understanding intervene in her life, maybe she would not have to, re to do that. See, because you know, we need to understand that the harm that we cause, that we talk about in the age seven, not only an act of addiction. That harm in those four or five years that we ain't working this process and we, and we start acting out on these bad ass behaviors and taking people hostage and, and crippling people from their, the process of their recovery, you know, that's the harm that we need to list. You know, we're talking about fearful of a four step. Well, when you start looking at the eight step and you find out that I haven't changed and I'm still doing the same thing that I've done when I came, to the, came into this process, well, then you're going to really start crying because I'm not that person who I really thought I was. Still. Still living in the illusion that every that the world revolves around me, and just because and just because I come in the rooms and I share that I'm staying clean and I'm doing all of these things, don't make me that good person that I want you to be. See all the time, you know, you, you know that everything ain't for the room shit. Well, I'm not telling you. I'm talking to my sponsor and I'm lying about that. You know how we did that. You know, I'm not telling everything, and then I'm wondering why I'm sick and I'm not growing because it's still a secret. You know, that's why they tell us, you know, the com complacency of the enemy of people with time in this process. And they tell us to be thorough. And that's why we have to be thorough with the stop. Because the program is outlined and he know that we're going to slip. He know that we're going to start thinking that we were all recovered. You know, he tells me that I better be thorough because at some point in this recovery process, I'm going to stop. It's going to cease. You know, we think every, every time we, we, we ingest one of them drugs that the recovery process ceases. No, when I stop applying spiritual principles to my life, because it says, when does recovery begin? When I start applying spiritual principles to my life. So I can stop applying those principles to my life at any time, in any area. So the recovery process is going to cease then. You know, and then they tell me when that happens, I need to reaffirm my commitment to the process of recovery. So maybe I need to go back and do a 90-90. Maybe I need to go pick that back and pick up one of them white chips and, 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 and surrender all over again to this process. You know, I need to do those things. That's how I keep it simple. Knowing that I, when, I, when I'm in trouble, I need to start doing something about it. You know, pick up that telephone and call somebody because it was, it was real light. It was heavy at the beginning, then it got light, then it got heavy, it gets heavy again. Because I got too much time to call you up now. I got 13 years. Fuck, I can't call a guy with six months. Why? It tells me that. The new member is my source of hope. Why can't I call my source of hope up? Why? Why can't I call that guy up one day? He's my source of hope. We tell him that. We, 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 we come up in the beginning and I share it. Oh, the new summer is our source of hope. Remember, ever remind us that recovery is possible. You know, welcome to the new member. You're the most important person. Well, make him feel important and call him. Call him when you're in trouble. Let him know that in 13 years I could be in trouble. Let him know that he's going to might be in trouble in 13 years or two days. You know, um, let him know that this is a disease with no known cure. You know, let him know that it's a disease with no cure. And then at any moment, that I'll lapse from some of the spirits of, from, from, from some of the manifestations of this disease. You know, I'll go back to some of those things. Some of those things that come back up. You know, shit. Uh, I still steal. I stole a bag of ice the other day. And I need to tell you all that because I don't want to go steal it no more. Friday, I stole a bag of ice. Went to Walmart. Buy the, got the cooler thing going because I got to bring my water in and my drinks because I can't buy that out of the machine because I'm too damn cheap. <laughs> and, you know, here, we live in, you know, we, we, we're here. You know, we're here in the finger like shit is out there. Yeah, you go to Walmart, you buy a place. Okay. You go buy all your stuff. I got to be here. I got to hurry up. Buy all your stuff. You pay for the ice. Where's the ice at? Oh, it's outside the door, you know, as you go out. Fuck. That whole freezer full of ice. I paid for one bag. I took two. Nobody ain't going to know. Well, all y'all know now. Ask me how my stealing goes in about another week because I might still be stealing and I want you to understand that I'm stealing.
I need to let y'all know that I stole the other day. You know, I can't walk out of here knowing that I'm stealing and don't tell nobody. You know, that's just how simple this process has to be. But to sum it up is my father died two years ago. The same man that made me feel all the shame and guilt. Well, that I took the shame and guilt and put it on myself because he didn't make me do a damn thing. That I put all the shame and guilt on. Before he died, my brother called me up. I called my sponsor. She said, I go, Paul, you need to go. Your father get ready to die. What the hell? You know, you got a lot of problems with your father. So I go. I go. See my father. We talking and all this other stuff. I bought him a Kango, but it was a bootleg one. He said, this ain't no real one. Fuck, he knew. <laughs> but anyway, before I left, he said, Paul, I love you. I had never heard that from my father. It took me 50 years for me to hear that my father, to hear my father say that he loves me. And had it not been for this program of Narcotics Anonymous and everybody in this room, the spiritual principles and the God of my understanding, I would have never heard that. I would have probably died not liking my father. You know, um, this program is an awesome program. You know, and I think for the first time I had an honest cry when I heard my father say, Paul, I love you. He always did, you know, but he was doing the best that he could with the disease that he had. He was my predecessor. He died clean. So it lets me know that there's hope in this program. And the miracle for me is just to be like my father, be able to stay in this process one day at a time and die clean. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please help us improve our ranking so others can find us by putting a review on Stitcher, iTunes, or your favorite podcast index. Napot is ad-free thanks to the folks supporting the show with a dollar or more per month. If you enjoy listening, you can join them by going to napot.xyz and looking for the donate link. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.